I think that is a big thing that we've seen with a lot of people who come in from a leadership perspective is having that confidence to challenge you and any visionary, because it's very easy for a visionary to say, oh, I've got all these ideas. Let's run with them. That's Jessica Mogul, seasoned business leader, head of coaching strategy at Crisp, and my right hand for the past seven years. I would say one of my biggest strengths though is actually being able to poke holes in things. And so being able to say, no, this is not good, or what if this happens? And I know all you visionaries are probably thinking, no, those people are gonna slow me down. Those people are gonna be so defensive and they're gonna not wanna make any progress. And it is not defensiveness. I just look at every scenario that could go wrong before we implement. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Jessica to discuss how leaders can free themselves up from the things that they're reluctant to delegate, why vision without execution is hallucination, and the ups and downs of working with your spouse. There are nights when we go home and we don't want to talk to each other. Like we have had challenging days. We are not on the same page about something and you can't take it personally. And that is honestly something that you just have to accept that and be okay with that. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Jessica Mogul is a master of operational excellence, serves as the leadership coach to many eight-figure law firm owners across the country, and also happens to be my wife. I wanted to start off by asking Jessica about her role and how it's evolved at Crisp. What do I do at Crisp? I usually sum this up by saying, what have I not done at Crisp? So I have literally done everything here except for shoot and edit videos. At one point, I built booths at trade shows. I did sales. I answered the 1-800 number. I've been a project manager on set. So usually when people ask what I do, it's more of what have I not done? Yeah. Well, and, and I'll mention in a moment just essentially how you came into the business, but let's talk about your background because not a lot of people know this, but you went to school to be an engineer. I did. So on paper, I'm an engineer, industrial engineer. And how I even ended up there, I liked numbers, I liked math, and I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. So my options were kind of being an actuary or an engineer. Got a full ride for engineering and did industrial engineering. So that's me on paper. And I did that for a couple of years, realized very quickly that that was not for me to be in uh, steel toe boots and hard hats going through warehouses in the Midwest. Fortunately, industrial engineering has a lot to do with processes. And so when I made a switch from there, it was a very parallel switch. So your operational background was very valuable in the sense that when you and I met and prior to you coming into CRISP, things were a mess. And, I, and I'm saying this with full humility and full transparency. So I had no idea what I was doing. I was like the textbook visionary. I had a lot of great ideas. I could work really hard. But what did I know about organizational structure, operational structure, processes, KPIs, all those different things. So for lack of a better word, at the time, it was a shit show. I mean, we were growing, but that was th just through sheer will and grit and hard work. And every day I'd get out of bed and I didn't know what, what would be the next fire that I would have to put out and deal with. And I remember that back in 2015, I'd asked if you could step into the business, maybe for like 30 days, help to put in some systems and processes in place, like help to create some structure around this madness. Coincidentally, that was also the first year you know, we exceeded seven figures in revenue. But tell me what went through your mind when we first even talked about this idea of these 30 days. For the record, I always have to start this. Michael and I were together <laughs> before I started at Crisp. So that's one of those things I always put out there. I was a road warrior prior to being at Crisp. And when I say road warrior, I was in 12 cities a month all over the country, uh, sleeping in a hotel room every night. And I knew I wanted a change. I wasn't sure what that change was. So when Michael proposed this 30 days, I thought, 
what's the harm? You know, I can use these 30 days, kind of figure out what I want to do. And also not really knowing what I was getting into. My first thought was essentially, oh, there's not going to be any more work in 30 days. Like I'm just going to go in and clean some stuff up and I'll be done. And I didn't really realize how much I guess I knew operationally. And I will actually attest when Michael says it was a shit show, uh, walking in and saying, okay, yeah, there's a few things that we need to tune up over here. We got to give the people listening some context because you being a road warrior in all these hotel rooms, you were doing business consulting, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, fair. (laughs) So I just want to make sure that people listening know what that's all about because, I mean, when you were traveling to all these cities, I I remember you had the Delta Diamond status and everything. You know, this is, you know, lonely me at the time. I remember this. I was so intimidated by your success very early on because we would go out to dinner. And I would tell you about this company that I'd started and I was CEO. But if you were to step into that company, you would see that I was CEO of very little. Let me just let me just put it that way. There you know, weren't that many clients. Uh, just a handful of, of employees, maybe just, just just a couple at the time. We had no structure. I mean, the only reason we we, we were even growing was just this, the fact that I was working hard. I was working my ass off at the time, and I remember like how composed you were as, as a human being. So I, I'm I'm very grateful that at the time you you still wanted to have anything to do with me, but. It was interesting in the sense that, you know, from my perspective, you had it all together. And I think I may have conveyed that I had more of it together. I, I didn't, I you didn't absolutely say, did. <laughs> I didn't say that it was as much of a mess as it was at the time. But I will say that, you know, there was like the proposal before the proposal, which was come in for 30 days, help put in some process and structures in place. Now, 30 days has now expanded well beyond 30 days. It's been years and years and years. But, you know, talk to what were some of the biggest changes you made when you first came on board? Yeah, I think the best way that you even describe that of what I was walking into, it's almost like on Instagram when you see expectation versus reality. (laughs) So in my head, you know, when Michael says I was a road warrior, I probably have trained over 300 offices, small businesses across the country. And so I have seen a variety of things from, you know, someone literally the business owner in the middle of day locking herself in an office and taking Xanax because she can't handle her team. You know, I've, I've seen it all literally. And when I came into crisp, I thought, you know, what am I going to see? Like they just probably need some processes. And the first thing that really stood out to me was there was no start time. Like people showed up when they wanted to show up. There was quote unquote, a huddle every morning, but who might be there? They may, they may not be there. I clearly remember every time we had a new hire start, I would literally text every single person and be like, please show up on time tomorrow. This is the person's first day and we have to set the right tone for this person. And so that was when I started. There were about five, six people then. I will say those five or six people are no longer here. We are now a team of about 80 people. So definitely have hit some road bumps and, you know, challenges along the way. Other things that floored me, there were no processes, literally nothing. So I remember people trying to get approval on videos from the clients. And I'm like, well, did you give them a deadline? No, didn't even think about a deadline. Client won't say it's approved, but it's already on their website. And I was just floored by these things when, you know, or we got a new hire. And I'm like, okay, well, who's in charge of the new hire? What are they doing? And no one knew anything. (laughs) So I guess from one's perspective, I had a clean slate. So we'll look at it that way. We all start somewhere. So one of the things I want to mention here is, is just because at the time, I was incredibly frustrated. And all the things that you just spoke about, like those are things that I did not enjoy. So meaning that I love the sales and marketing. I love, you know, just the vision, the strategy where things would go. But when we talk about things like whether it was processes, anything from the operational, I mean, even aspects of the hiring process, all those things, I could not have imagined that there were people on this earth that love those things and actually conversely actually did not enjoy the things that I loved. Yeah. So I think that is a key component of us working together. And I think any people who are working together really closely is being able to complement each other and not being the same. So at Crisp, we use tons of assessments and whether people are visionaries or they're more operationally structured or everything, you need variety there. And I think also a really important aspect that you mentioned, the fact that you love sales and marketing so much, you're a sales and marketing visionary. And essentially, 
I didn't want that. And I think something about a person in this position, they have to really be okay being number two and they have to actually love being number two. Like I don't actually envy you or anything that you do every day. <laughs> well, I will say for those listening, it was a battle to even get Jessica on this podcast just to put that in perspective. But I felt that it was a message worth sharing and that it would be valuable to people. So for those that are listening right now, let's say somebody else maybe feels that everything is a mess in their firm. They're constantly putting out fires. What's the first thing you recommend they do? First thing, you got to take a look in the mirror. (laughs) So whatever is established at your company, your firm, you've established that. If you are the CEO, if you are the owner, you have endorse that. You know, the other day I heard a great quote, you endorse what you tolerate. And if somebody is consistently late and you're like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, you're endorsing that. And the rest of the team sees that. And the biggest thing, you know, I really always focus on culture, people, processes, but your A players do not want to be around mediocre people. They just don't. It actually will deter them and push them away. I find that ego plays a large role in driving any type of organizational change because there was a time where I felt that the things that I wasn't good at, it was important for me to get good at them. I mean, there's there's business fundamentals, I think, across the board. Like, you know, if you're going to grow any organization to any level of scale, you will need organizational processes, SOPs, KPIs, all these different things that are necessary for a business to grow and scale. Yet, if that's not something that is your strength, Rather than focusing on how do I develop this weakness, lean into the things that you love and are your strengths and instead find people like yourself. Yeah. And I think it's also people, you know, when I say people like myself, I'm a very, very structured person. Michael's not kidding. It took a very long time to get me on this podcast. Uh, So anything that's kind of outside of my norm, I uh, really have to think about that. I have to process that. And what's interesting, though, is in this position, you have to be okay being uncomfortable. So especially you're working with a visionary CEO, you can't be entirely stuck in your ways. I actually remember When I say there were no processes, Michael at this time was making every single sale and uh, 1-800 number rings. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you do? Like, how do we replicate this? And we didn't have an answer. So I made a process and then I hand Michael this beautifully packaged up process. And I said, okay, great. So here's your process. You can do something and we, we can test it or something. And he goes, great. Uh, you're going to shift the 1-800 number to you and you're going to test the sales process. And I said, great. So that's how I learned to do sales at Crisp was because I was pushed outside of my comfort zone. But I think that's really important because you can't really grow within the company without pushing yourself to those limits. Yeah, I, I remember even the time where not only do we not have a hiring process, which I mean, now it's amazing. We teach on the hiring process that we have now. Um, we didn't have a formal onboarding or training and development process or even curriculum, any of those things. And I was getting frustrated. I'm like, why are these people not working out? And I mean, it's hundred percent my fault because number one, we weren't vetting them properly on the front end because there was no hiring process. And then once they were hired, how are we training and developing them to be successful in their role? And there was no training and development structure. It's, it's kind of ironic in the sense that everything we do now on the coaching side of the business and we work with law firms is based on all the lessons that we've learned. But what's so fascinating to me looking back is that I love business. I'm, I'm obsessed with it in the sense that I was reading the business books. I was going to the business conferences. I knew the importance of having these processes or these KPIs or formal onboarding or training and development. Like I knew these things, you didn't have to convince me of them. And yet, despite reading all those books, you never really truly understand that the most important thing instead could be from a leverage standpoint, how does this actually get done? We talk to law firms about this all the time. When we ask them like, how many of you know, you know, if you need systems and processes in your organization, every hand goes up. And then you ask, well, how many of you actually have clearly defined every single process in your organization? And like one, two hands go up and then half of them are, you know, are being dishonest. And at some point learning more about what the process to create isn't going to help you create the process. And the reality is you're never going to do it. You know, never, ever, ever, ever going to do it. Prove me wrong. But instead, the shortcut is find somebody who loves processes and is operationally minded. And just I'm sure there's going to be people listening to this that are wondering, okay, I've heard enough. Where do I find me, Jessica? 
That's a great question. I've actually become, I think, a, what is that, a noun now, a Jessica, finding a Jessica. So again, I never planned to be here as long as I am. And honestly, I couldn't see myself doing anything else. But it's interesting when you say that about asking for owners. I was talking to a client this morning and he has a workshop coming up. And I said, great, have you blocked out your day that you get back to sit down with your right hand and go through everything? And he's like, oh, let me do that right now because he knows he knows he will go back and nothing will get done without this person who is going to actually execute. And so there will be an interesting transition in this conversation because we're also married. And so how do you find a Jessica? Oh, this could go on forever. <laughs> so the interesting thing is, is, of course, we trust each other immensely. Uh, so there's that side of things. And then you really have to find someone, though, again, like I said, they have to be okay being number two, being behind the scenes, being the operational person, and honestly, someone who is okay challenging you. I think that is a big thing that we've seen with a lot of people who come in from a leadership perspective is having that confidence to challenge you and that person, any visionary, because it's very easy for a visionary to say, oh, I've got all these ideas, let's run with them. And so I would say one of my biggest strengths, though, is actually being able to poke holes in things. And so being able to say, no, this is not good. Or what if this happens? And I know all you visionaries are probably thinking, no, those people are going to slow me down. Those people are going to be so defensive and they're going to not want to make any progress. And it is not defensiveness. I just look at every scenario that could go wrong before we implement. I'm not saying don't do it. I just want to have every potential cage <laughs> barrier everywhere to protect it. Well, I mean, if nothing else, to find whoever it is that you're looking for, let's say someone to run the practice, whether it's a COO, integrator, whatever, or whatever you want to call the role, I mean, you have to spend some time actually looking for this person. Now, I will say that you were the only person that I was ever, you know, dated that I brought into the business, right? So now, obviously, we're, we're happily married. I didn't try this out with other candidates. <laughs> but I will say that as we've grown our operations team, and now we have a COO, all, all these different things, I mean, we don't have to get into this in detail because this will become a five-hour podcast, but we have a formalized hiring process. We have, like, you know, a battery of assessments that we give to these people. We look for very certain types of skill sets, and we look for, you know, in terms of role alignment, all those things that you can vet out on the front end, but the fact that someone sits down in front of you and they tell you they're going to work hard isn't enough of a reason to you know take a chance on them. Oh, no. Hiring people is the hardest part of this. We know that. We've endured that. Uh, one of my mentors actually says running a business is easy. It is the people aspect that's so difficult. And I also like to preface this with the fact that I personally had never hired anyone before being at Crisp. I will never forget the day Michael assigns me. He says, hey, let's go. I need you to hire a marketing coordinator. And I'm like, cool, where do I start? And, you know, we're a startup at this point. So any budget or anything, I'm just like so weary of how much money we're going to spend. And then I start getting hundreds of people who are just clicking apply, apply, apply again you're the marketing and salesperson, I am not. So I don't even know what I'm looking for in hiring these people. And so I really started honing in on who is this as a person. So I knew enough about maybe some assessments or some questions to ask. And so our hiring process has been refined time after time after time again. But I will also say anytime we have abandoned that process, anytime we have skipped a step, anytime I've made any exception, it has backfired. So when I say that we have a team of over 80 people now, there were a lot of lessons learned along the way. <laughs> and just to give you credit, and I say this all the time, I think people think I'm doing this to, you know, be kind to you, but it's the absolute truth. If I had not found you or let's say a person like you, so somebody who was, you know, amazing at the things that were not my strengths, I could have continued to grit it out. Maybe we would have, you know, we would have passed a million, maybe, but we would not even be anywhere near where we are today. And, and for those that don't know, I'll catch you up. The business doubled every single year in headcount and revenue for eight years straight. We've hit our targets every single year since the inception of the business. And now well into the, to the eight figures and have grown. And now we're working with thousands of law firms across the nation. And that was not the case when you and I started. I mean, we, at the time, I don't know that we worked with any law firms yet. I mean, this was, this was brand new, but 
I want to highlight the importance of that, but more so from the standpoint that what you allowed me to do was you freed me up. And I was able to focus and spend my time on the things that I loved and that were really not just the highest and best use of my time, but that were my strengths. And that's where I think a lot of that growth happened because, you know, I was able to do my thing, the thing that, you know, just excited me, you know, gave me energy and ultimately grew the business while also having somebody there that could help lay that foundation and make sure it all worked because that part I think is just as if not more important of actually laying the groundwork, having the strong foundation. So what would you say to someone who, let's say even as a CEO or a leader is, they know they need someone like this, maybe they don't have them, but they struggle to get out of their own way. That's a tough one because I think you and I still have challenges with that at times. And it also goes back, I know I reference assessments all the time. You have a very unique one in terms of you have the ability to see the details, to see the processes, to see the big picture and everything. And so it's interesting because it's a control thing. And I think almost any visionary or CEO who goes out to start their own business to some degree there is a control factor within that because that person wants the freedom to be accountable for what happens, whether good or bad. And so you have to get out of your way, though. And I think that does go back in terms of making sure you have someone who is OK challenging, because at the end of the day, I will say one thing and I, I tell every person we hire coming in, Michael wants to be challenged Like he does not want you to be a yes man. And I think it's really, really important for any visionary to communicate that on the front end, because the only way you're going to make progress is if you have someone who is going to be able to push back and have healthy debate. So we got to get to it. This is the one that I think they've all been waiting for. How do we make it work? And how have we made it work all these years? Because now we're married. And I know I mentioned earlier where, where does someone find a Jessica? You can't have Jessica. In fact, if you want to lock down Jessica, you marry her and you have a kid. But that being said, over the years, it hasn't been easy. I, by no means, because I, I want to be honest with people that are listening. I mean, I think growing a business is, is difficult no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you're doing. There's just the challenges that come with that. But then also doing that with your spouse, I think, can introduce even more challenges at times. Oh, yes. It is not for the faint of heart. It is not for everyone. I would actually say really, really look deep inside your soul if you are ever considering this. Again, you and I never had the intention of this spanning across many years. Uh, We thought it was going to be for 30 days, but there's a lot to this. I think the pro, of course, like I said before, is that you're not going to trust anyone as much as you trust your significant other being in the business and being the one running payroll or being the one who's mindful of budgets and how much money you're spending and all of that. But at the same time, there has to be some level of separation. And I will admittedly say before we had a child, that separation was pretty non-existent. (laughs) Yeah. I will say there's someone running the payroll. I mean, who else could you trust more once, you know, our daughter popped out, we were running the payroll in the, at the hospital. I literally have a photo of this. (laughs) So, uh, this also though expanded us and made me look at succession planning a little bit differently and making sure that we had layers there because yeah, it was time for payroll and guess who knew how to do that? you and I. So there's actually a photo of a little newborn baby. And I'm sitting there saying, please stay asleep for just 10 more minutes. And I'm running payroll on my laptop. But also, again, who do you trust to do that? It's hard. Like I, again, it is not for the faint of heart. Um, And I think that routines are really important. I think that whether it is daily routines, whether it is vacation routines, but you really have to set time aside for yourselves and you know, it's really hard is you and I would always say, okay, we're not going to talk about business. But the reality is that's kind of all we had to talk about. I mean, even our first date, (laughs) we talked probably until midnight about work. And it was like what you were doing versus what I was doing. And that was kind of even the beginning of these conversations. So even if you say we're not going to talk about it, you'll end up talking about it. You know, I will say this to our credit. I believe we've done a very good job of this over the years in the sense that at the office, unless you were explicitly told and I mean, you, you learn that we are married many times, I think you can go weeks or months without knowing that, you know, we're even together. And I think that stems from the fact that at the business it's and in the office, it's business. 100 percent. 
you are harder on me than any person here. And I think that it should be that way. I don't want special treatment. I don't think that I deserve special treatment. Uh, it is funny that you say that, especially when we were a lot smaller, also before I was a mogul, it was not so obvious, of course, that we were together. But a team back when there were probably 10, 15 people They actually filmed a video while Michael and I were on vacation and interviewed each person and asked how they found out (laughs) that we were actually together. It was hilarious, the stories, though. I mean, people literally had no idea for months that we were together because that separation and that professionalism has to be there. That's something I've always been very wary about, too, having trained so many offices. If the significant other was, you know, involved in the practice, I've seen it go both ways, and I have always made a very conscious effort to not just be, you know, oh, well, that's Michael's wife, and, you know, she gets her way or anything. No, you're harder on me than any person here. So I've seen this when people have, let's say they're in the business with their spouse, I've seen it have disastrous effects, like disastrous. I've seen relationships not only deteriorate, but end over it. It's not even just them, let's say, working together. Sometimes it's just you have the person, let's say, the CEO of the firm, and then you've got the husband or wife that's at home, let's say there's a different career path, but it's like them not knowing what they signed up for when you're in a relationship like that. And I've seen people try to make it work because you know they'll hear about, well, let me bring my, my husband into the business, let me bring my wife into the business. I would say that, you know, from the onset, I think look back even to the first date, because I remember we had this conversation. It was having complete clarity of like who I am and what you're signing up for and saying, hey, this is the out, because the worst thing is to, you know, to figure this out years later once you're married and have kids. Oh, yeah. So I will say that is something from the very beginning. There are even times now when you spit out some crazy idea and you're like, are you, you cool with this? And literally my answer every time is I know what I signed up for. So I, I know exactly how ambitious it's going to be, how crazy it's going to be. But that alignment from the very beginning could not be more important. And it's interesting too, when you say that about, you know, someone who maybe has a stay at home spouse, because that also can be very challenging. And that was one thing with us working together is like, We've never questioned late nights. We've never questioned how long, you know, someone's going to be there. And and it doesn't just work on one way. I mean, there are nights where you've gone home and I'm still at the office, but we've we've never like challenged that or been like, where are you? Or, you know, we're we're in it together and we know where we're going. Yeah. And I, I will say if the thing that we've done annually, just as we do goal planning with the business and we, you know, we, we set targets, we do the same thing personally as well. I feel that that alignment is, is very, very important. You know, if you're in a relationship with someone, you guys want two different things, you're going to be guilted if you're at the office late, you know, why are you there? So late? and it's just going to create this, this friction, if you will, that makes what we've seen in many cases with, uh, with, with many, you know, just law firms and, and other business leaders that growing a business is hard enough. To do that when you have somebody in your personal life, a spouse, actively, not maliciously, but working against you, if you will, not being on the same page, man, it's like trying to climb Everest with an anchor. Oh, yeah. So that we've always been really, really fortunate with. And I think that also leads to a great point of everyone has off days. Everyone has low days, high days, whatever that might be. And so we have this understanding in terms of morale or whatever you want to call it, but we both can't be down at the same time. And that's one thing in terms of whether it's at home, it's at work or anything, one of us has to be the stronger one who's able to kind of carry things through because sales and marketing and operations is just this little circle of things. And there's always a place that needs attention. And so one of us is always more stressed than the other. Correct. Only one is allowed to freak out at a time. Yes. Um, (laughs) What about what about the other rule around uh, complaining? Oh, yeah. You can only complain about it once. And that was something we set up very, very early on. There are even times sometimes where if I, I preface it with, I'm just complaining. I'm not asking you to solve this. And just, again, it's expectations on the front end and making sure that I'm not coming to you to dump something on you. But also, once I complain that one time, the second I start to bring it up again, there better be a solution. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's basically, I can complain about something one time, you'll hear me out, but then the next time it's either do something about it or accept it. And that's it. And it's a, it's a good model. It's a, I think we've learned this over time because I do want to touch on the fact that it's, it's not always great. It's not always, things aren't always amazing. And in fact, I want to touch on the fact that as is, is the business 
grew and we entered just these new like levels with the business, the almost like these growing pains. I mean, you have so much evolution happening in the sense that the business itself is very different from what it was back in, you know, 2014, 15 and so on. I mean, it's just on a very, very different level of scale. And we didn't know what we didn't know. So we're learning as we go, like, you know, with, with a lot of the aspects of the business, I guess let's talk about some of the really difficult times and how that's impacted us. Because on the, on the bright side, you're in it together. But then uh, the, you know, the downside, you're in it together. Oh, yeah. It has <laughs> the, the up and the downside of being in it together is not always being able to have that separation. So as much as you say that you're going to do it or that you want it or anything, and like I said, before a child especially, it was way, way, way more difficult. But yeah, I mean, there are nights when we go home and we don't want to talk to each other. Like, we have had challenging days. We are not on the same page about something. And you can't take it personally. And that is honestly something that you, you just have to accept that and be okay with that. And it's almost kind of like at, at the company, if we are critiquing a video and we're giving feedback, we are critiquing that edit. We are not critiquing that as a person, as a human who did that. And so the same thing goes for the two of us. And when there's feedback, there there's feedback. And it has to be constructive, but also it can't be taken personally. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been a fun ride. I mean, looking back, it, it is a, a joke with people. It's like, you know, we look at the uh, you know, the years we've been together, it's almost like dog years, right? Because many people when they're, you know, in a relationship or married, in the morning, they leave and go to work. And then in the evening, they get home and they see their spouse. But we get up in the morning and you know we get our daughter ready and everything like that. And then we go to work like together. And then we're at work together. And then we go home together, you know, all, all those different things. And you mu multiply that across years, we're together a lot. Oh, yeah. And I think that's where I mentioned routines before are so, so important. And again, it always goes back to alignment from the very beginning. So I know from the very beginning, you've got things that are non-negotiables to you, but it's the same way you know I've got non-negotiables to me. And if I need silence, I need silence. And it goes back to not taking things personally. There are nights I will sit next to you on the couch and I will not say a word for two hours, but you know I'm not mad, but it's just having some level of boundary with all of that. Uh, we'll say this, and this might get edited out of the podcast, but come on, you know, it's... Uh... I remember, uh, you, you hate when I say this, uh, I remember like we were having a, a conversation. You're like, would you ever cheat on me? And my answer was when, and, and the reason probably not the right answer. I know someone's listening to this. They're like, oh, that, that was definitely not the right answer, but you know where I'm at basically all the time. I mean, our offices are across from one another. We, we know each other's calendars and schedules. My email is shared with you. Like, and this actually was interesting because it made the proposal I had to be so, so strategic. I mean, you, you were looped in with the finances and like everything like that. So you'd see, so I remember when, when I first got the engagement ring, I had to order it through like a separate account that I had to create specifically to, to place that order. I had it delivered to our neighbor's house. And then when it was going to do the proposal, because fortunately we had a, uh, a video shoot in Australia that, that you were there for, you were project managing it at the time. I was going to surprise you in Australia, but how could I go, you know, it's a 24 hour flight you know, almost, you know, a day and a half, two days without checking in or being in contact. Then I knew I had to be on a flight for 24 hours straight. If you want to talk oh, about that story. This was a great one. So, uh, yeah, I'm in Australia just, you know, living it up. Not really because I'm so jet lagged. <laughs> and I remember just messaging with him as, you know, usual. We, we aren't really big on talking on the phones. And so everything was like via text, via text. And then suddenly your text started going green instead of blue. And I am not one to ever really question anything. And then it comes a point where it's been like several hours and several hours. And so I'm like, oh, is he actually like, okay. Uh, so I reach out to your assistant at the time and she's like the most wholesome, amazing human in the entire world. And so she has a hard time lying, but she lied. <laughs> and uh, she's like, oh, I don't know. I think he's looking at maybe some new office spaces. So maybe his phone is not working. And I was like, okay, really didn't think twice about it. But I will say the whole thing that set all of this up is Michael, actually, you intentionally pissed me off. And I remember the client, I remember the videos, and I remember you saying, what happened with these? Why are they late? And I 
I went into total defense mode because they were not late and they were accurate. And I basically said, fine, I don't want to talk to you for 24 hours. So he knew what he was doing. <laughs> I, I had to, I had to, I had to come up with some reason. I had to pick a fight just so you wouldn't get worried if you didn't hear from me for 24 hours. Cause I was on a flight on the way to Australia to surprise you this engagement ring. And then I bust into that, um, that hotel room, like in the dark, you probably thought someone just broke in, but here I am on the other side of the world. And you know, the next minute we are engaged and we're eating uh, kangaroo meat. Yes. The next question was actually, are we going to do this or what? <laughs> Look, it's, it, it, this is one of those things at the time. So what's interesting is from where we started to ultimately, you know, when we did get engaged at the time, I mean, we were already, I mean, there's, there's few things that I think are more intimate than building a business together. It, truly, truly. I mean, whether you're in a relationship with somebody or not, it's just, it's a level of vulnerability that you have to have. And it's just a level of connection that I think you have to have to make it work. We were living together. We were working in the business for a number of years together. So where are you going to go? You know? Oh, yeah. It's it's <laughs> hard to escape. I actually remember taking a trip and without you. And I went to Vietnam for two weeks uh, with my family. And it's funny because you talk about how like you still remember those two weeks of just isolation in a great way. And I take no offense to that. I actually was even saying how, you know, next year or this year, I don't know, I'm going to go away for a week just by myself. But that's not offensive to either one of us. And I think that's really important, again, to have that understanding. So definitely levels of self-awareness, definitely understanding. And then now we're parents too. So meaning that we, we, we have our, you know, our second child, first one being the business. Now we've got our daughter Mila and it's very important. So it's, it's actually so interesting too, because I think you learn a lot of great parenting skills when you're growing an organization with a lot of team members, you're parenting adults, it's a little bit different, but there's a lot of similarities. You know, it's also very important for us to be in our daughter's life. So like, if you could speak to what are some of the things we've done to be very, very present and engaged in her life? Yeah. So obviously first time parents, you have no idea what's coming or what to even think. Uh, you don't know which way is up. And we actually put Mila on a schedule from a very early age and we made a commitment to each other that bath time was a non-negotiable. And she's over two years old now and it's still a non-negotiable. And especially as she's older and she obviously has conversations with us now and everything. The other non-negotiable in this is we don't talk about work. You know, even though she's only two years old, she understands everything. And we made that a, a clear point from very early on. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't go home and get her to sleep and then maybe we work again or we bring up work and have conversations around that. But I think just having that expectation on the front end that, you know, this is what we want to do. We want to be present. And again, you can't have one person always being like, well, where are you? Where are you? I'm doing this alone. And so we never feel like we're alone in either venture. I remember when that rule first took effect that we weren't going to talk about work when we got home, especially for those first few hours with our daughter. And I remember like sitting there, I'm thinking, okay, so what are we going to talk about? And I looked out into the front yard and I'm like, man, we need to do some landscaping out there. You know, like I, I was like, what is, there to, what is there to talk about? I mean, for you, for years, that was the, you know, the main topic of conversation. And don't get me wrong. I think I want to clarify for people because I, you know, I don't want someone to get the wrong impression when they're listening because they may, you know, they may look at that and think, this has been a really great ride. Like we genuinely enjoyed doing this. And I don't want to put words in your mouth. You can, you can speak to what your experience has been, but everything from not just growing the business, but what that's meant for our relationship, um, how we've been able to spend time together, really quality time, how bath time is a non-negotiable, like meaning being home for bath time and being actively present, you know, including like the weekends and so on. But being able to not have to make that trade off in the sense that we do want to grow a great organization, make a huge impact in the lives of a lot of people. At the same time, you know, family is also a top priority, as is health and exercise and all those things. And I think we've been doing a better job. And over the last several years, we've made it a clear priority of those three things of being able to have each one of them be a, you know, a top priority in our life. Absolutely. And it doesn't always happen the way that you plan ever. So it is interesting, you know, when you say that Crisp was the first child, 100%. Before actually having a child, 
oh, I was here seven days a week. We were here until 10 o'clock at night. Like there were no boundaries with that. And so it's like integrating that in and even that change from not having a child where I'm like, oh, I can go work out in the middle of the day. I can get up at six. I can do, you know, work out at six. Those things are gone when you have a child. And so it's learning to be able to still prioritize yourself and, having those routines and those boundaries. Like I have an app every morning with my daily habits and it's very important to me to exercise, to meditate, to just make sure that those routines are in place, but it's respecting those for each other. And honestly, that's what does make it fun. And while you're meditating, your man, Michael is watching the child. We're usually still asleep, but you know, keep an eye on her. And when you're on the Peloton, I'm watching her. When I'm on the Peloton, you're watching her and it's just like this, I think it's amazing exchange, if you will, of saying that, look, health is important for, for both of us, you know, spending time with our families, like our parents and so on is important to both of us. The business is important to both of us. So it's not easy, but I, I'll tell you what, I mean, there's I mean, people are like, well, where do you find the time? I always ask them like, well, where are you spending the time? It's like asking somebody without children, you know, someone like that saying, man, I'm so tired. You know? Oh, don't ever like, get me started on yeah, that one. <laughs> like they don't know what they're talking about tired. Or they're like, I don't have time. And you're like, yeah, you know what? You can find time, especially for things that you prioritize. And maybe if you weren't binge watching Netflix or whatever it is you're doing and, and whatever your time is going, I, I think you start to get much more like not just efficient and effective, but much more diligent with the way in which you spend your time, both at the office and then also, you know, even outside of the office so much more intentional with the time. And that's one of those things I think becoming parents made us way more efficient in terms of how we do spend time here. And I know we joke about people binge watching Netflix, but you know what? We still find time to do that every now and then too. So it's not, you know, how do you find the time? It's really, you make time for what's important to you. There you go. Now, Jessica, you're clearly a game changer. This being the game changing attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? Being a game changer especially in my role, is really being a selfless individual. So I would actually say in the most humble way, because you tell me, but I'm selfless to a fault. And it's being able literally to put everyone else in front of you. Because when you are building a foundation for a company and you are hiring and you're training and you're firing and you're doing all of those things, you're always, always thinking of what is the best interest of the company? What is the best interest of this person? And if I don't do this, am I doing a disservice to that person? So being a game changer is being a very selfless person. I love it. Jessica, very grateful for you. I hope this is the podcast that someone listens to and forwards to their spouse. And then the spouse gets upset because, you know, because they're like, well, why can't you be more like Jessica? (laughs) Or why can't you be more like Michael or whatever it is? And they're like, why are you trying to make me someone that I'm not? And I would say nothing else. It's very, very important. If you haven't already, have the conversation about what your goals are, what it is that each one of you wants, what your priorities are, because if those two are work, you know, are not in alignment, it's going to be very difficult to accomplish anything. And I think it will create a lot of guilt and resentment and all those different things. I think we're very fortunate that we got that conversation out of the way early on the very first date. But I would say that most people I found that that either they have not had that conversation and, you know, for whatever reason, it creates, you know, stress and struggle and so on. So in terms of working with your spouse, when it works, it's the best thing in the world. But alternatively, it can completely go the other way. It's just being very clear on roles, strengths, all those different things. And I think we've found a, you know, a way to make it work over the years. And a key thing you really said there too, is, you know, not trying to make someone something that they're not and accepting, you know, better, don't throw me into an unknown situation right on the whim without letting me process it. Same thing. I'm not going to sit you down and say, I need you to write out all these processes. And so being really accepting of who each of us is and utilizing that for the positive. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner who you believe would benefit. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Jessica Mogul, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit gamechangingattorney.com. And join us next time and we'll be talking to Eric Sue, entrepreneur, marketing guru, and best-selling author of Leveling Up, How to Master the Game of Life. I think it's really important for people to understand 
you have 3 billion people in the world that have played a game. Could be Tetris, could be Duck Hunt, could be Fortnite, whatever. And there's still a stigma tied to it, but now we all know it's inevitable. And so I have this weird intersection where I spent a lot of time in my life gaming, and I've intersected that with marketing, which I think is a game, and also business, which I think is the ultimate game. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Oh, 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 oh